<laughs> Thank you for being with us here today in the room and also virtually. Um, I just want to thank you all again for such vibrant discussions um, yesterday, and I really hope that we can carry through the same energy and um, you know sense of urgency in our discussions today as well. So we talked about a lot of things yesterday. Um, you know, we started the day with a nice um, kind of foundations laying discussion by Karen Carroll in the first panel, really understanding where we are today in terms of the rapid diagnostics that we have access to and those that are in the pipeline. And you know some of the the successes and failures we've seen in the devel development and market uptake side, um, and then we moved through the day and really started to throw out some great recommendations and some great stepping stones for us to really start to carve out a path forward. So thank you again for all your contributions so far, and please continue to be as creative and um, forthcoming in the discussions today. Um, today we're going to start off by uh, revisiting the bioethics issue that Tracy Cohen walked us through yesterday in a very thought-provoking way. Um, and we're going to do so in a very special way. We're going to start the conversation in a very special way. So um, without further ado, can you please dim the lights? You are the leading experts, the most brilliant minds. You shape policy, inform public opinion, and advance the pursuit of science, engineering, and medicine. So you know that antibiotics are failing us. The sad reality is that too few people outside this room seem to understand the threat AMR poses, or even what the acronym stands for. Alexander Fleming, <clears throat> in his Nobel Prize acceptance speech, issued a warning that AMR was coming for us. The problem is that we didn't listen and now we're losing the battle against bacteria. Thought leaders have been trying to get this issue on people's radar for quite some time, but it has not penetrated the American consciousness the way it needs to. As a country, we need that aha moment with AMR, that moment we understand how many lives are at stake. We can get there by applying the principles of storytelling, by infusing the issue with emotion. There's so much that can be learned through the voices and experiences of people living with and dying from AMR, more so than through the details of a particular strain of bacteria. These experiences are as diverse as they are misunderstood. How can you treat a disease if you don't know about the body carrying it, about the life within that body, the person him, her, they? My interest in all this started when I was a young working mom. I was pregnant with my third child when doctors saw an echogenic bowel on the ultrasound, which led to a series of tests. It would take six weeks for the definitive diagnosis of cystic fibrosis. Faster diagnostics would have made this difficult period way less harrowing. I cried for a week, and then I heard from a friend that CF isn't always diagnosed at birth. I knew instinctively that my son Micah was OK, but that my daughter Mallory had it. And yet specialist after specialist kept telling me she was fine, that her symptoms didn't mean that she had the disease. It was heartbreaking to find out that Mallory did, in fact, have CF. How do you tell your three-year-old that she has a life-altering lung disease, that she will need her chest pounded twice daily when she's healthy, hard enough to dislodge sticky mucus? There was no children's book back then to explain it, so I wrote one. Mallory's 65 Roses, because 65 Roses is what kids hear when adults say cystic fibrosis. This book taught Mallory the power of narrative. Compliance was never an issue until one day when Mallory refused to do treatment anymore. We explained that CF could be fatal and that daily therapy wasn't optional. She listened carefully and then she ran out of the room crying. Mallory didn't speak to us for three days, but after that she never missed a treatment. And she started writing, creating a chronicle of a girl trying to make sense of the world and her place in it. Mallory did have a happy childhood with no significant health challenges until she was colonized by Burkholderia sinocipatia at the age of 12. Her doctor said this would change the trajectory of her life. Suddenly, Mallory had an expiration date. It was hard to process. I developed a mantra. No pity party. Mallory would come to adopt her own, live happy. 
Middle school was not problematic. This is Mallory with her brother Micah on the day of graduation. But high school was another story. Mallory was in and out of the hospital, each time needing IV antibiotics for weeks to months, which led to resistance. Despite her health challenges, Mallory was a typical high-achieving teenager, family-oriented, a straight-A student, and three-sport varsity athlete. Second half of senior year, Mallory got very sick. Of this time, she writes, as the days wear on, I find myself panicking as I grow more oxygen dependent, experiencing pain with breathing, no longer able to walk without help. But outside of the hospital, life goes on. Even if I do get out in time for prom, I won't be able to find a date. So I asked her water polo coach, Rob Bowie, pictured here with the boys team, for help. The next day, Dylan walked in with flowers, which motivated Mallory to work hard to get her strength back. To her surprise, she was voted prom queen, and it was an incredible evening until the after party. Someone threw a smoke bomb into the venue. Mallory's throat started to burn. Her lungs were searing. Her eyes and her nose were watering. And then, hemoptysis, when the airways bleed. Mallory writes of this experience. Each time it happens, I wonder if this will be the time when the blood spilling up my lungs and out my mouth will burst forth so fast that I can't breathe. The time, my homoptysis, isn't just a scare, but the final, swift, deadly bullet. Terrifying moments like this had distilled for Mallory a profound understanding of how precarious life was. It's why she felt the need to document everything, to collect the wisps, the threads of her untidy happenings. Her words, with time I grow decreasingly confident in the plans that I had etched in my mental map until it's hard to remember they were ever there. I'm working hard to see beauty in a life that looks quite different from the one I wanted and expected. Mallory was finding her voice and wanted to use it. In her high school graduation speech, she quotes the universally respected English philosopher, Winnie the Pooh. I used to believe in forever, but forever was too good to be true. Words she chose for their relevance to her classmates, but that also had a private meaning inspired by what she refers to as the dark voices in my head, the brokers of hopelessness. No one understood her distress because Mallory still looked so healthy that many thought she was the golden girl who had it all. She would have traded everything for the chance to take a breath that didn't hurt, to have a life that wasn't defined by illness. College presented new challenges. After growing up with a helicopter mom, Mallory was ready to be on her own, but it was a difficult transition. Mallory writes about the duck syndrome, when students are like ducks gliding on the water. What no one sees is that underneath they are paddling furiously. The stress of working to make things seem effortless creates a vicious cycle of silence and struggle. This applies to physical and mental health issues that so many of us experience. Mallory had both. Over time, she adjusted, but along the way there would be many more hospitalizations. With each admission, Mallory's medical teams would come to her room to talk through the treatment plan after they had started her on a cocktail of IVs. Routinely, in this order, cultures were taken, antibiotics were prescribed, drug susceptibility tests were performed, cocktails were altered. From my lay understanding, this is what leads to resistance. Once again, faster diagnostics would have helped stave off this issue. Over time, the bacteria got thicker and stickier. As Mallory's, Mallory's body deteriorated, she sharpened her mind, crystallized her thinking, and honed her writing skills, creating poetry out of prosaic experience in thousands of pages of private journal entries. Straddling the sick and the well worlds, Mallory understood that amplifying patient voices could have implications for society, which is why she spent 10 years documenting what it was like to live with resistant bacteria that was a known killer. Lyrics from Hamilton resonate. Why do you write like you're running out of time? In hindsight, it's clear Mallory knew she, <clears throat> she was. Mallory's words, I am limited in what I can do, but not in what I can say. Resistant bacteria does a lot of taking, of dreams, of time, 
of travel, of friendships, of freedom, of potential, of plans, of lives. It's a complex, unpredictable, irreversible, progressive, painful, suffocating, choking weed. When I developed a fungal infection, things got even more complicated and emotionally traumatic. I used to have fun, be fun. Now I'm afraid of everything, of being myself, but also losing who I am, that the choices I make are going to cut my life short. I'm going to be on voriconazole, an antifungal, for the rest of my life, and it's very hard on the liver, so drinking is a big risk, which layers on the fear that if I can't drink anymore, I won't enjoy college because everyone drinks. I'm afraid that I won't be happy, won't have friends or a significant other. Sex with a pick line and an IV drip? Ugh. I'm afraid I'll always just be that sick girl. And yet Mallory persevered, graduating from Stanford Phi Beta Kappa and writing her first book, The Gottlieb Native Garden, A California Love Story. Mallory was offered another book contract, but working independently was lonely. So Mallory interviewed for a writing job at a company with lots of young employees. The company made her an offer, but when she disclosed her medical condition, they withdrew it. Mallory was distraught. AMR wreaked havoc on her life in other ways, too. One time, she was set to have a third date with a guy when a lung function test led to a hospital admission. Mallory was so sad to have to cancel. I suggested she invite the guy to the hospital to see if he could handle it. One very special nurse helped her get ready for the date. In the ICU, she washed her hair, gave her a pedicure and facial, and ran to the drugstore to get Mallory mascara. Mallory had a wonderful time on the date, even though he wasn't her person. The following New Year's Eve, Mallory met Jack, who I call her real-life Prince Charming. But shortly after they got together, Mallory was back in the hospital, the antibiotics had stopped working, and the only option left was transplant. Unfortunately, Blue Cross denied. The battle raged for weeks. They employed multiple stall tactics that Mallory felt were intended to run out the clock on her life. We needed a miracle. Eventually, Mallory was approved, but only because we knew someone who knew someone. Skewed social and economic policies and care practices made things easier for Mallory than for many others. Mallory did not want to accept the evaluation because she felt guilty that others hadn't been as lucky. I urged her to use her privilege, her access, and the power of the pen to expose this injustice, which she did. The approval meant a cross-country move since UPMC was the only center willing to take on her complicated case. Mallory had to say goodbye to everyone, knowing she might not make it back. This is the day we left for Pittsburgh. Mallory's hugging Micah on the left, and there were oh so many tears. But Mallory was happy and hopeful when we arrived. As the days and weeks passed, her excitement gave way to hopelessness because she started to feel like that call would never come. Or if it did come, it would be too late. So at that point, I changed my mantra to somewhere over the rainbow there are lungs. And I would sing it to her just the first line over and over. These were long, hard days. Mallory struggled to breathe, struggled to stay hopeful. She worried that lungs might not arrive in time, and she would end up in the ICU clinging to life. If that happened, she writes, I want to be as comfortable as possible through opioids or anti-anxiety meds but not be so out of it that I'm unconscious unless the pain is severe enough to necessitate that. I want to maintain dignity to whatever extent possible, to receive whatever life-saving tactic is appropriate, to be able to communicate in some way, to have the blinds open for natural light, to have calming music to listen to, to have my mom or dad with me always. I want to live. The call for lungs finally came, but it was a false alarm. Mallory describes in vivid detail the ticking time bomb, her fraying emotions, her unraveling nerves. Many months later, the fourth call was a go. Despite her fears, Mallory was so excited to receive the gift of life, new lungs. The recovery was grueling, but one month later, Mallory was celebrating her 25th birthday without supplemental oxygen. 
Those days I would sing to her, somewhere over the rainbow there were lungs. Note the rainbow on her cake and the smile on her face. It was the happiest time as we dared to dream about a new life. But a few weeks after that, the Cepatia was back. Mallory was out of options. Mark wasn't willing to accept that and went in search of phage therapy, a promising treatment that was all but abandoned when penicillin was discovered. Penicillin could get patent protection while phages could not. Mark asked epidemiologist Stephanie Strathy, who had used phages to help save her husband. She turned to Twitter on behalf of Mallory, pleading to researchers around the globe. Meanwhile, at the doctor's urging, our closest friends and family flew across the country to be with us. Because Mallory was on a ventilator, she scribbled this note, which reads, can't talk at all, but so grateful you were all here for the hardest part. Herculean efforts enabled the United States Navy and APT to find a phage match for Mallory's isolate of Cepatia. That night, Mallory became the first patient in the US with cystic fibrosis to receive phage therapy. We were filled with hope. But the very next morning, doctors advised us to make the gut-wrenching decision to remove life support, explaining she had been without oxygen for too long. Saying goodbye to Mallory was impossible. She was imperfectly perfect. It was while we were in acute grief that the autopsy report came back, revealing that the phages had started to work. Mallory just didn't get them in time. Mark couldn't save his daughter, but he was certain phage therapy could save others. So we shared Mallory's story with the media, introduced the idea of using phages for kids with CF to the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation and raised money to make the inaugural grant to IPATH at UC San Diego, which is leading the first ever NIH-funded trial using phage therapy for CF patients. Around this time, Mark went dipping for phages in a sewage treatment plant. Once again, lyrics from Hamilton spoke to me. Who lives, who dies, who tells your story? I worked with Random House to have Mallory's writings published posthumously as Salt in My Soul which led to the documentary of the same name. Was it fate or divine intervention when The Lancet published the largest study to date about superbugs on the same day the New York Times referred to Salt in My Soul as an awareness-raising tool about the possibilities of bacteriophages? And then Forbes writer Judy Stoin penned the headline, Poignant Film Calls Attention to the Need for Phages for Antibiotic Resistance. Advocacy seeks to ensure that all people can have their voice heard on issues that are important to them. The seeds of my advocacy were planted by Mallory. With her writing, she left me a way to share patient insights, raise awareness for AMR, introduce phage therapy, and address the need for better diagnostics. Since her passing, I've been doing this at medical schools, universities, high schools, bookstores, ladies' luncheons, community events, conferences, corporations, Capitol Hill, the White House. Next week, I'll be on a panel for the US debut of a new musical about Alexander Fleming and the discovery and demise of antibiotics. <clears throat> I'm not a doctor, a scientist, a lobbyist, or a paid publicist for this or salt in my soul. Just a grieving mom trying to make sense of the world and my place in it now that Mallory is gone. In so doing, I have come to understand that we are dangerously close to a post-antibiotic era. There is a way to fix this. Kevin Outerson, the executive director of Carbex, says the science to express, address AMR is extraordinary. It's the business model that's broken. A collapse in the drug development pipeline at the same time superbugs are proving to be an insurmountable enemy has led to government, drug companies, and many in this room collaborating on a global revival of antibiotics, antifungals, phage therapy, and better diagnostics. Any conversation about medicine these days must address the gaps in our healthcare system. In theory, Health equity means increasing opportunities for everyone to live the healthiest life possible with access to care, no matter who we are, where we live, or how much money we make. 
In practice, it's quite different. To a patient with a superbug, to a parent of a child suffering from resistant bacteria, to a healthcare provider trying to save the life of someone with AMR, health equity has an additional meaning. It's the great divide between those blessed with good health and those who struggle to stay alive. To achieve health equity for this population, we need treatments that will work against resistant bacteria, faster diagnostics, antibiotic stewardship. Mallory was only 12 when AMR came for her and derailed her life. She had so much to live for. AMR was secondary to cystic fibrosis in Mallory's case, but it is what killed her. There is a human death toll to the dearth of effective treatments for AMR, to the dearth of faster and more targeted diagnostics that could help us preserve the current drugs in our arsenal. Antibiotics have a short enough lifespan. We need to be more careful with how we deploy them. Mallory is just one of the many millions who have died or will die from AMR. Resistant bacteria does not discriminate. Mallory had access to every possible treatment, but still she died. I've learned that sharing Mallory's story is helpful to many parents <clears throat> who lose children to drug-resistant infections and feel guilty that they couldn't do more because of their socioeconomic status and lack of access. The reality is that we, were all, we are all at risk. Take Tori Kinneman, a gymnast at Duke who contracted a superbug in the athletic setting and almost lost her life. And Kathy Granger, a healthy woman who got sepsis from a simple cut and had to have her legs and fingertips amputated. After speaking at the National Amputee Coalition Conference, I learned that amputees live with an increased risk of bacterial infections, and they're just one of many groups affected. This all led to another aha moment for me, which was that I had to do more. Desperate times call for creative solutions. Since statistics don't trigger empathy, we need to employ the power of story to put a face to AMR the way Tom Hanks did for diabetes and Angelina Jolie did for BRCA. Mallory did not write for 10 years to be the face of AMR or to tackle an urgent global health crisis. Will Battersby did not adapt her memoir to put the issue of AMR on the world stage. And yet, by putting a face to AMR, Salt in My Soul is quietly pulling audiences into an immersive experience underscoring the urgency to develop new treatments and faster diagnostics and shedding light on policy opportunities. Bringing a patient's words to life can trigger that aha moment, that transformation in perception that will make this crisis feel real and help people understand that deaths from AMR were and are preventable. The low cost of antibiotics has blinded us as a society to the value of knowing what bug is causing our bodies to fail. We need to curb the evolution of drug-resistant bacteria, rapid tests that can identify the pathogen-causing infection and their antibiotic susceptibilities, narrow-spectrum antibiotics targeted to drug-resistant bacteria, policy and incentives to support the appropriate use of both. Global awareness about the devastating public health threat superbugs pose. AMR is not just coming for us, as Fleming warned. It's here. Mallory would have been 30 yesterday, October 12th. We need action now to save lives, since science, told through story, can change hearts, minds, and behaviors. I asked the director of Salt in My Soul to create a trailer specifically to raise awareness for AMR. I'd like to share it now. Thank you. I guess I should have said I'd like them to share it now. <laughs> 
things seem to be getting worse instead of better. Seems like I'm resistant to the antibiotics. I was colonized with Burkholderia sinocepatia, otherwise known as B. cepatia. This germ is very resistant to antibiotics. Uh, is the germ that we never want any CF patient to have. We knew that her life was going to be much harder and shorter. Her lung function was less than 30%. It was necrotizing pneumonia that was going fast. From the very beginning, I sensed that there was a lot of courage on Mallory's part, that she had a lot she wanted to live for. She wasn't done. Every single decision that I make has a life or death significance to it. She you know, took out her opinions and her feelings on her journal and then tried to just live a happy life. I feel like people with CF are privy to secrets it takes most other people a lifetime to understand. How lucky we are to be alive. That we can leave behind a legacy when we go that will impact others. That simple things are often the most beautiful. That love and happiness are the most important things to strive for. So hopefully that reminds us all why we're here. And it just, I'm sorry. <laughs> it always gets me hit. <laughs> um, I think Diane is absolutely right in thinking we need to put a face behind what we talk about as AMR, superbugs, all the different names. Um, and I think Mallory's is it. And I don't know if anyone said that to you, but I just really want you to know we do this all day, right? But we are in the weeds. And it just is very helpful to have your perspective here today to kick off this final day of really discussing how we make change in this space and how we prevent the death of amazing individuals like Mallory Smith. <sighs> Sorry. <clears throat> So without further ado, I'm going to ask Amanda Jezik to join me up here. And Amanda's joining us from the Infectious Disease Society of America. And she will introduce the panel for the next discussion. Good morning. Um, so I'm Amanda Jezik. I lead public policy and government relations activities for the Infectious Diseases Society of America, which represents over 12,000 infectious diseases, physicians, scientists, and other healthcare professionals um, all across the country. And AMR has long been um, one of our highest um, public policy priorities. Um, and I agree wholeheartedly we need um, a face of this story and hearing um, from Diane about everything that you and Mallory um, went through is incredibly powerful and I can tell you firsthand I've been working on this issue for over a decade and your voice is making an impact and we are seeing so much more attention and momentum because of the power of your story and Mallory's story Mallory. so well, thank you. <laughs> well, I am happy to introduce the next panel, which is focused on health equity considerations for diagnostic development and use. And I'm really excited to be getting to moderate this panel because I believe every conversation that we have in this country about any healthcare topic needs to be centered around health equity. Um, so our panelists will each give some opening remarks, and then we'll have a moderated discussion, and we'll welcome questions from the audience, um, folks participating both in person and virtually. 
So without further ado, I'll introduce our panel. Um, we'll start with Dr. Nicholas Evans, the Associate Professor and Chair of the Department of Philosophy at the University of Massachusetts Lowell, where he conducts research in public health and research ethics. Then we'll have Dr. Daniel Bosch, the Senior Advisor for Global Health Security at FIND, the Global Alliance for Diagnostics in Geneva, Switzerland, overseeing FIND's program on AMR, and the President of the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. It's a lot, it's very impressive. <laughs> then we'll be joined by Dr. Melinda Pettigrew, an infectious diseases epidemiologist and interim dean at the Yale School of Public Health. She also serves at the, as the Associate Director of Scientific Leadership Corps, overseeing the diversity, equity, and inclusion initiative for the Antibiotic Resistance Leadership Group. And finally, we'll have Dr. Anthony So, Professor of the Practice and Director of both the IDEA Initiative and REACT, Action on Antibiotic Resistance Strategic Policy Program at the Johns Hopkins School, uh, sorry, Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. He has previously served as the co-convener of the UN Interagency Coordination Group on AMR that delivered recommendations to the UN Secretary General. And we'll begin with Dr. Evans. Well, thank you so much to the committee for having me out today um, on this slightly uh, better weather than we had yesterday uh, here in Washington, D.C. Um, it's, a, it's a privilege to be here, and it's a privilege to talk about uh, public health um, as it interacts with AMR. And I'm kind of going to explain to you in a bit that bioethicists don't talk a lot about AMR. And I think one of the reasons they don't is they kind of feel that this is one issue where there's not actually a lot of debate for us to get into because the moral clarity of the situation is kind of settled. Um, and so I kind of want to dig into that um, and what we can think about regarding rapid diagnostics and detecting antimicrobial resistance. Um, and to frame this um, as, a, as a dual national, my, my focus will start domestic, but I will very quickly move towards issues of global distributive justice. Oh, is that going to work? No? Nope. It takes a minute. It's takes a minute? Yeah. All right. Nope. Oh, there we are. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so when I was asked to do, uh, to give this talk, to be part of this panel, one of the first things I, I did was I went back to um, some of the first writings that the National Academies has done on antimicrobial resistance starting in 1998, because I wanted to understand what issues around health equity uh, the the National Academies have really covered when it comes to antimicrobial resistance. Uh, and it turns out they have not. Um, going back to 1998, to the first report that I could find on antimicrobial resistance, um, there is no mention of health equity. And I think one of the reasons for this is that health equity is a fairly new term. Um, we're all discovering this term, health equity. Um, and so one of the, the next thing I did was I was, uh, I said to myself, well, the dominant paradigm in American bioethics for a long time has not been equity, but justice. So maybe there's something on justice in there to find. Turns out there is not. Um, there is a 2016 report that I found on the, the little library out the front here um, that kind of scared me for a minute because I don't like to be wrong about things. Um, and so I, I very quickly looked through and I found that my good friend Lisa Lee, um, who is now the Vice Provost for Research at Virginia Tech University, but was the Executive Director on the President's uh, Commission for the Study of Bioethical Issues during the Obama Administration, had been on an infectious disease panel. And she did talk about justice and justice as a global public good in the context of infectious disease research. But that particular uh, report only mentions antimicrobial resistance in one subsection of the entire report. So that's a report about justice, but not about antimicrobial resistance. Um, so this kind of frames the setting that health equity has not been necessarily a priority when we think about antimicrobial resistance as a bioethical issue. And it turns out that antimicrobial resistance has not been an issue that bioethicists have thought about very much at all. Um, so a Search on PubMed will show you that between 1997 and 2022, 16 articles were written in the English language that cover bioethics and antimicrobial resistance. Now that's not bioethics, antimicrobial resistance, and health equity. That's anything to do with antimicrobial resistance. Um, and it turns out four of those 16 articles were written by my graduate supervisor. Um, so I kind of knew where this was going a little bit um, when I saw his name. Um, and I actually asked a friend of mine from NIAID yesterday why she thought this might be, and she's like, well, surely you bioethicists think this one is a no-brainer, right? Antimicrobial resistance is bad. 
we should fix it, um, kind of ethics done. Um, and I think that that's true to a certain extent, but I also think that one, um, the history of bioethics has largely not focused on infectious disease at all. Um, ethics and in infectious disease didn't really come onto the scene until about 2003, 2004, um, which was timed with SARS-1. Um, and in particular, we tended to focus in bioethics on higher profile respiratory pathogens that tend to make headlines and JAMA op-eds because that's our stock in trade. Um, so we were focusing first on SARS and then on influenza and then on Ebola and then on SARS again. Um, whereas, uh, as was rightly put by the last speaker, antimicrobial resistance is something that's kind of creeping um, and has received almost no attention publicly and thus has received no attention um, from bioethicists as a result. But those papers that do cover antimicrobial resistance are very clear that this is a distributive justice issue. And in particular, it is a distributive justice issue, um, which I'm going to use as a proxy for health equity here, um, regarding certain groups of people having excess access to, ant uh, to antimicrobial medications and other groups having substandard access to antimicrobial, uh, sorry, to antimicrobial medications, um, which are two kind of push and pull drivers for antimicrobial resistance worldwide, among other things. And so I got to thinking, what would the issues around diagnostic access to try and limit the frame of my discussion here so I don't go on too long, um, what issues might we uh, unpack? And because I'm a sucker for a triptych, I came up with three, um, and that is the use of samples in research, um, diagnostic data and sample sharing, and then cost and access, because I think that these are the three headline items uh, for any discussion of health equity in the context of diagnostics and AMR. So the first is to think about what it actually means to do research on AMR. And in the US, uh, the common rule gives us uh, a definition of what it is to do research at all, which is, uh, in very, very brief, to create generalizable knowledge. Um, but one of the things that the common rule also does is that it exempts all public health surveillance activities, including the collection and testing of information on biased specimens conducted, supported, requested, ordered, required, or authorized by public health authorities, as research. Um, globally, there's a lot more diversity in what does and doesn't count as research, and that's in part because the US definition of what is and isn't research is actually fairly idiosyncratic on the global stage. But one of the things that I would like to kind of provoke you to is that antimicrobial diagnostics are and should be a form of research. And this is in part because we are tracking the movement of the evolution of these pathogens. Um, and one of the things that diagnostics gives us the ability to do is to target these pathogens much more neatly, much more cleanly with the medications that we should to uh, engage in better stewardship by not using medications that are going to promote resistance. Um, but we have to be able to know and share this information. And once we know and share this information, we are engaged in the practice of developing generalizable knowledge, that is research. Um, now, why do we not elevate this to the status of research? Well, I'll give you three letters. It's called IRB. Um, and people who do not have to engage with IRBs as the chair of an IRB, I have found, will avoid doing so, um, including up to the cost of science itself, right? It is much easier to just do public health um, and then maybe later go use that secondary data set to do a retrospective study or something like that once, once we're long past the public health moment um, than it is to actually come through and develop re research protocols and treat this like a research e exercise. I'm not going to say that all scientists do that. That's obviously false. Um, but this is definitely something, especially working uh, with public health experts in COVID, um, that has been an issue. Um, one of the things we need to do then is we need to engage in data management and data harmonization and standard building so that IRBs know what diagnostic research looks like in AMR. They have less trouble uh, uh, kind of mistaking it for something else, and they are able to push it through IRBs rapidly. The best thing you can do to an IR for an IRB is create a standard protocol so they can tick it off. Um, and that would actually elevate us to research status, which would actually give us a lot more options when it comes to developing uh, pipelines and standards for treating AMR. Um, the next is uh, diagnostic data and, and sample sharing. So you've got all your data, you're trying to get it worldwide because AMR is a global problem, but in the past, there's been a lack of consistent effort and attention uh, to domestic and international data uh, sharing and sample sharing in public health responses. I'm going to give you two examples. One is Indonesia's decisions uh, in the early 21st century to withhold avian influenza samples because they felt that the research done on those samples would not be used to the benefit of the population of Indonesia. And the other is Sierra Leone's inability to retrieve Ebola virus disease samples from the United Kingdom after they were collected during the Ebola pandemic due to UK national security restrictions, which class 
like we do, Ebola samples as potential bioweapons. Um, so they could not actually get their own blood back to do research on it. But sample and data sharing are core global equity concerns. And ensuring uh, access to these results um, uh, hampers host nations. Um, and there are also costs to our isolationism, because if people don't play ball with us when it comes to AMR, we are also going to suffer from the effects of AMR arising in other countries and moving into us. And then finally, and to touch on the last speaker, uh, cost and access, I think, is the key equity driver here in AMR. Um, AMR is, regard, uh, is regarded in bioethics issues as an issue of distributive justice, and its cause is an issue of distributive justice. That is overprescription of antibiotics in wealthy countries and underprescription of antibiotics in poor countries. Um, and Michael Soglid, my graduate advisor, identifies this as the failure of market-based healthcare allocation. But so too, issues of diagnostics can become issues of distributive justice and equity if applied in the same way. For example, COVID, COVID testing early in the pandemic was free, but the cost of applying that test, depending on which state you were in, was not free. Um, I, I believe it was Texas Presbyterian was charging $300 per COVID test in 2020, not for the test itself, which was deemed free at the point of care, but for the cost of the nurses who were, allocate, who were administering those tests. Um, diagnostics that are unaffordable globally are a waste of resources because we cannot treat a global problem if not everyone can get access to these diagnostics. This then, uh, to finish up, um, brings to light the ethics of design and implementation. We have to partner with nations and with public health departments to develop diagnostics that can be delivered at point of care and that can be delivered at point of care no matter what that point of care is. So we're not thinking about Emory as the standard point of care, but rather we're thinking about anywhere as the standard point of care. Um, because this is the public health ground game for antimicrobial resistant diagnostics, is you have to be able to do it everywhere um, if you're going to kind of address this as a global problem. Um, so my red light is flashing, so I'm going to leave it there. Thank you so much for your time. Great. Th thank you very much um, for one of the thank, first of all, thank Diane Cheddar Smith. That was really just a, a moving story this morning to, to get us really um, laser focused on this. So thanks very much for sharing that. And then I want to also thank the organizers for inviting me and also for um, not really realizing that I'm not an AMR expert. So, and so that was, uh, I was able to pull that uh, over on you. But where I do have some expertise and why I think I can address this issue is because I have a lot of expertise in pandemic response, and so I worked a lot more. I was talking with some other people yesterday, more on the virology side, but nevertheless, as everyone here knows, we're in the midst of an AMR pandemic. And so there are some commonalities and, and, the, and the ways that we need to address that. In all pandemics, one of the things that we always see in pandemics is there's an equity issue. There's an equity issue in who gets the resources to fight the pandemic, and it can be across nations, across regions, it can be across cultures. So it's not just, okay, what happens in sub-Saharan Africa and what happens in the United States. It, it's what happens to different populations within D.C. or whatever place you want to take in the world. So there, there's an, always an equity issue, and, we, and it's very consistent in every situation that you see that people who are more disenfranchised and, and on the margins um, are generally the ones who suffer the most. So a few words on how we combat that. First of all, um, it's the messaging. And so I think you know that powerful message this morning was really great, but it's also true that not everyone knows that message yet, and so we still have a lot of work to do there. And, and it's not only on the political level. I think you know, th this is a, as we all know, this is a sort of a slow, well, fast moving, but, but not newly announced pandemic that we're in, right? We've been, I think you've all been in meetings for a while now, and I'm not the first one to ever say that you've ever heard say, well, there's an AMR pandemic. And so, th you know, that message is there. It's not necessarily falling on the right ears. I think one of the one of the issues that we always have in public health is we need constituents, right? So it's not just a question of getting the political buy-in, but you have to have constituents. If you look at HIV, you know, what really has driven HIV over the years is there's people who were in the streets with their, their feet and their votes and their voices who said, this has to be done. We don't have that in AMR, right? This is still something that we know about it. We get the message to a few political leaders. We get the mes message to a few people who have been impacted. And we've had some powerful messages here today and yesterday morning. But we still don't have that constituency. And so how do we build that? How, how do we get so that people are really saying to their political leaders, we need to do something about this problem? I don't have the answer to that. I think it's not easy. But I think that's really where, where we need to target, because it's the constituencies. And, and we all know that that's how, how politics work. Right? And, and people you know, have very frank um, conversations with 
people on the Hill and, and say, well, you know, I'm only here for four years, I think, or I'm only appointed for a few years, and I don't know what the next administration is going to do, so I need to, you know, I, I'm not going to do this really until we have somebody saying, I'm, I'm going to vote for you or not vote for you when the time comes around. So that's an effective message that really needs to get to the right ears. And then on the R&D side, we have some very significant R&D um, developments that are promising, and we need to to push with that, and Bill gave some of the, that yesterday in, in terms of the diagnostics that are coming out. We have some really great tools. They still need to get into the right. There's a lot of regulatory issues. There's use cases, still a lot of things that need to be worked out, but they're promising. Key to um, the equity issue in diagnostics, first of all, is that we need to get beyond the idea of binary diagnostics, that you either have or don't have a particular illness. And so I can tell you from lots of experience, I've had experience um, running Ebola treatment units and, um, and responding to lots of outbreaks. And if you go and you talk with the patient or you talk with the Minister of Health where there's an outbreak and you say, good news, you don't have Ebola, everybody's happy for a second, right? There's a brief smile, but of course then they wait, right? Because you don't really want to know what you don't have. You want to know what you do have. And if you're sick with something that people thought was Ebola or people thought was, so was COVID or whatever it may be, um, you're glad that you don't have that, but you're still dying or you're still sick of something, right? So we need to get by the, um, beyond this binary diagnostics. But we have some tools that can really help us. And same, same parallel if it's an outbreak and you say, good news, it's not this thing. Of course, what we want to know is what it is. That's a, an extremely important part of that. And then, of course, we need to do this, and still some good news here, at a price point um, that is amenable to populations across the world. And we talked about that yesterday. So it's not just a question of solving the, the AMR crisis here in the United States or in high-income countries, but we need to um, think about this globally. The, uh, the other um, things that I wanted to mention, and I did mention this in a comment yesterday, incredibly important is that we don't build parallel systems. So the integration of AMR into routine health systems is what will, and, and for any pandemic, is really what's most important. And so we see this in outbreaks. A lot of time you have an outbreak of Ebola in West Africa and people put together a surveillance system for the next few years and then they don't detect any cases and it goes away. And then the same thing happens for a lot of things. We're struggling now, right, to see, well, people still make COVID um, diagnostic tests, right, because the, the cases are fortunately falling off and keeping businesses in that um, in that market is extremely difficult to do. And the way that we detect pandemics and pandemic threats is have something that is integrated into the routine healthcare system. So it has to have value to the patient, has to have value to the public health system, to the Ministry of Health. And so that's the way that people say, okay, this is important for us to keep paying for, keep invested in. Otherwise, if, if you just look for that odd thing and you put together a, a system to look for that odd thing after doing 10,000 or 100,000 or a couple hundred thousand um, tests and it's negative because many pandemics, of course, these pathogens are re relatively rare. They say, why would we possibly pay for this? We have so many different things that we have to worry about every day. And so looking for this is not going to help us. So integration of AMR diagnostics into the routine health system so that they have practicality um, every day is extremely important. And then um, addressing the equity issue more specifically. So advocacy. Advocacy is extremely important. The presentation that you gave this morning is extremely important. But I'm not optimistic enough about advocacy alone. One minute. OK, Ron. Um, about advocacy alone to, to say that that's the only thing. It's not only the ethical argument. We need to build, um, build equity into the systems. And what I mean by that is more distributive manufacturing around the world, pipelines that are not dependent on a few different countries. And so extremely important not only to advocate for the uh, equity, but to build equity into systems so we're not so vulnerable. And then um, lastly, universal health coverage is extremely important. No one gets diagnosed of anything if they don't get seen in the health system. And so access to care is an extremely important. I, I was going to mention a few things about creative financing, but I think I, I mentioned that yesterday, so I won't go into too much detail. But we do need creative financing. We all recognize that just a purely simple economic um, approach to this is not going to work in the United States. It's not going to work in LMICs, and so we need to get beyond that. Um, last two comments. I, I think Bill mentioned in his discussion yesterday, and I talked with a few people 
um, yesterday one-on-one, -on -one, we're thinking it fine to how to build a diagnostics alliance. Um, this is not something to bring all the money into one place, but this is to galvanize partners, and I think AMR actually would be a good focus um, for that initial alliance, so I hope that you'll hear more about that. And then I would be remiss in my duties if I didn't encourage you to join us at ASTMH in our annual meeting that's coming up um, next, uh, at the end of this month in, in Seattle, October 30th through November 3rd. I know many of you will not be able to change your travel plans, but you can also join online, and then we encourage you to investigate the society and um, see what that brings. And many of these sorts of conversations are things that we would welcome in that context. So thanks very much. And we have our virtual panelists ready to go. Yep, I'm ready. I hope everybody can hear me. So thank you for having me. I'm sorry I cannot be there in person. Um, I'm going to take a primarily US-based focus just to add to the comments of others in the group. And I think we all understand that there are profound inequities that are woven into the US healthcare and public health system. And these inequities are inextricably linked to structural factors and social determinants of health. And I think we also understand as a group that inequitable outcomes can in originate from diagnostic inequities. And diagnostic inequities are really a lack of a fair and just chance to have access to the benefits of these diagnostics. And so one thing we have to do is really ask the question, do these inequities exist? Where are they? And how do they manifest? And they can manifest across the trajectory of care. As an example, the li literature on racial and ethnic disparities in AMR are sparse, they're conflicting, data are not routinely collected, they're not routinely checked for accuracy in healthcare settings and in surveillance, but there's strong reasons to suspect that these inequities exist. And we do know they exist for a subset of infections. For example, community-acquired infections such as MRSA have been well-documented. There are sexually transmitted infections such as Neisseria gonorrhea, where we see large inequities by race and ethnicity. But different groups have differential exposures. These may be due to employment, access to care, differences in prescribing, living in crowded housing, differential access to health literacy. And there are also behavioral issues that may alter an individual's um, exposures and risk. And some of these behaviors may be highly stigmatized. So they may put these individuals at extra risk and they will also determine and influence how they interact with the public health and healthcare systems and how they are received when they interact with these systems. And so one thing we need to do is identify these inequity risk groups and we need to acknowledge that these can arise from a range of attributes. So I mentioned race, ethnicity. There's also issues around sex, sexual orientation, gender, there could be inequities across the lifespan, pediatrics, older individuals, rural versus urban divides, disabilities, insurance, and socioeconomic status. We also need to think about the drivers of these inequities and how we define our labels and risk groups. And so we need to understand what are the mechanisms that underlie these inequities and how does that play a role? So as an example, if we think about race, this is a social construct and it can be related to, but it is distinct from biology and genetic factors. So when we're thinking about social drivers with inequities, are we really thinking that there are biological factors that influence how a diagnostic or a drug would work? And if it, we think there are biological differences, then we really should be talking about genetics and ancestry as opposed to race. It's the same with biological sex. Are there differences between males and females in, in terms of how drugs are metabolized or in terms of how diagnostics will work? Or are these sex differences more gender-based? For example, how do people experience care? What services are they offered? How do they interact with the healthcare system? And the challenge is that these, these questions are not explicitly asked and they're not always addressed. So for example, the Presidential Advisory Council on Combating Antibiotic Resistance, PCARB, has generated a national report, the 2020-2025 report. This is a great report. It identifies low goals and objectives, and it also identifies challenges. And I took a quick read through the report. And many of the challenges center around the high cost of the components of the test, technical difficulties in preparing and obtaining samples, the time to result, limited return on investment, creation of evidence-based guidelines. But the words equity, inequity, disparity, race, ethnicity, these don't appear explicitly in that report. And it's very difficult to address a challenge unless you name it. 
We also need to be explicit in our discussions about inequities and how we address them. And we really need to view things through an equity lens. And this is really a set of questions that we ask ourselves when we plan, develop, and evaluate policies and programs. And counteracting inequities will requ require input from multiple sectors. And we'll have to identify how diagnostics are conceived, how they're approved, how they're studied, and how they are implemented in the field. And there are work groups that are working on this. So the CDC has um, a explicit framework to address in health equity, and this is part of their core initiative. We also need to design research that quantifies and characterizes AMR and inequities. And we need studies that enroll participants who are representative of the populations that bear the burden of disease. And so there has been work in this space. So in 1993, NIH began um, or was given explicit legal authority to direct investigators of funded research to ensure greater representation in trials with respect to gender, race, and ethnicity. But these NIH policies do not apply to private industry. Since 1985, the FDA has required sponsors of new drug applications to present efficacy and safety data by gender, age, and racial subgroups. In 1988, there were successive guidelines that called for greater inclusion. And, and then and more recently, in 20, 2014, the FDA published an action plan for encouraging trial participation. So these were limited regulatory requirements for reporting, but these FDA policies have been part of a voluntary guidance to industry. And after decades of mostly voluntary and aspirational initiatives, we still lack adequate participation in trials. In June 2022, the U.S. House of Representatives passed legislation intended to increase the diversity of populations enrolled in clinical trials of new drugs. And so study sponsors will now be required to submit a diversity action plan, including goals for enrollment, access to increasing access to, with, for certain demographic groups. And these policies codify the recent FDA draft guide, uh, guidelines that many of you may have seen. But these new diversity provisions, they don't fully resolve the underlying cause and the problems. So why are certain groups not accessing clinical trials? And these may include restrictive eligibility criteria, costs associated with participation, and limited art outreach. So we really need federal incentives. These could take the form of direct grants, collaborative networks that were mentioned, and we really need to just have the conversation. So using an equity lens will help us identify the potential impacts of individual institutionally underserved and marginalized individuals and groups and we need to identify and eliminate these barriers. So we can set global standards for diversity and research studies. We can adopt US and international guidelines requiring representativeness. We can conduct post-marketing surveillance studies and study outcomes to monitor effectiveness. And we need to collect data on the demographics. But again, these risk groups and their identities are very hard to define and there's no standard agreement about what these groups are, what the labels are and what they mean. Okay, but nevertheless, we have to work towards a place where we do have some standardization and protocols. And at the end of the day, there's a lot of diverse pathogens. Uh, these are complex issues, and these things will have to be tailored to the specific groups that are at highest risk. And I will stop there. Thank you. I believe I'm next up, and I believe uh, slides are coming up as well. Uh, let me first thank uh, Diane for sharing Mallory's powerful and courageous story, and your, your story as well, Diane. Uh, and for all that you're doing to address AMR, we can only be inspired uh, to do more. And thanks also to the forum's organizers for the opportunity to share some reflections on innovation access to AMR diagnostics, particularly through the lens of global health. The mismatch between innovation access to AMR diagnostics could not be more stark in the resource limit settings of low and middle income countries. Take Sub-Saharan Africa, the region that the Lancet Graham study noted with the greatest burden from drug resistant bacterial infections. Yet as the recent MAP set project revealed, laboratory capacity on the continent is not well prepared to carry out the AMR testing that might be needed. Only 1.3% of the 50,000 medical laboratories in the 14 countries studied in fact, conducted bacteriology uh, testing. In eight out of the 14 countries studied, bacteriology labs were geographically accessible to less than half the population. Four out of five of the labs surveyed performed fewer than 1,000 antimicrobial susceptibility tests per year. 
If that does not spell inequity, I do not know what would. To patients in resource-limited settings, the barriers to access extend across the entire value chain. Might equity be path-dependent? When the value proposition for commercially investing in a point-of-care diagnostic suited for resource-limited settings falls short. When the diagnostic is priced out of reach. Or when healthcare workers opt for the empiric use of antibiotics because there is no diagnostic nearby. These barriers to equitable access at the technology, financial, and structural levels are deeply intertwined. Should we be asking where and for whom diagnostics are brought to market? Does it matter? How we finance such innovation can influence who is positioned to bring forward a new diagnostic to market. And we might give more strategic thought as to how push incentives that pay for the inputs of R&D and how pull incentives that pay for the outputs of R&D can work to build the innovation ecosystem and the kind of access we hope to see in the world. Pull incentives typically advantage those groups or firms that have the capital to run the race for a prize. Recognizing that, the Longitude Prize on antimicrobial resistance offered discovery awards to provide seed funding, a push incentive for teams to get their ideas off the ground. And we may need to do more with push incentives if we want to encourage those who might bring an alternative approach focused on low and middle income country settings. The shared criteria that called for diagnostics to be affordable, sensitive, specific, user-friendly, rapid and robust, equipment free or simple, and deliverable to end users has long captured this vision that we might extend the reach of diagnostics down the pyramid of a country's healthcare delivery system from referral centers to peripheral clinics. To reach the base of the healthcare pyramid in low and middle income countries, there may be trade-offs in test performance. Consider a novel diagnostic test for bacterial pneumonia. As in the table on the right, we might consider four scenarios each projecting the lives saved by different diagnostic tests. If the tests were good, but not perfect, but could be fielded where the infrastructure were minimal, that is in the lower left-hand quadrant, the, be the benefits returned from use of the diagnostic tests might outperform even a perfect test that only works where there's advanced infrastructure. As part of our work on transformative technologies at institutions for the Hopkins Alliance for a Healthier World a few years back, we spoke to laboratories working on low-cost diagnostics and some of our colleagues spoke to the challenges of positioning such technologies, trying to avoid the perception of double standards and to anticipate how to navigate the expectations of regulatory agencies when seeking market approval for diagnostics better suited for conditions of minimal infrastructure. How can we better speak to these concerns? Even when diagnostic technology is effective and affordable, we need to be attentive to the unintended consequences of such interventions when deployed. In a program of integrated community case management of fever, community health workers applied a clinical algorithm that combined rapid diagnostic tests for malaria and respiratory rate to diagnose pneumonia. Compliance with a malaria diagnostic test was high and unnecessary use of malaria treatment was curbed. Yet in some settings, when the malaria rapid diagnostic test was positive, investigators discovered that antibiotics were less often prescribed, even if the respiratory rate were high enough to also diagnose pneumonia. And more significantly though, when a malaria test was negative, overuse of antibiotics was seen even if the respiratory rate were normal, suggesting absence of pneumonia. And this overuse might have stemmed from the healthcare provider's interest to give something to the child. Behind the diagnostic, there is the sociology of how it works between provider and patient. To ensure equitable results from diagnostics, we need wraparound implementation research that fills in our understanding of what happens when such technologies are deployed. Now, there are many opportunities to learn from examples like the gene expert system. In the global health space, the gene expert system became an important advance, widely used for the diagnosis of TB and rifampicin resistance, thanks to the work of CEPID, Fine, WHO, and other partners. The technology platform, though, is pricey. Some estimate $17,000 per machine and proprietary, and certainly with infrastructure requirements and upkeep well beyond assured criteria. Its volume discounted price per cartridge is just below $10 per test allowed as introduction. But we might ask as a global health community, what lessons are there from its success and its shortcomings? If we were again to invest the estimated over $250 million in public funding, would we seek the next time round an interoperable platform rather than a proprietary one? How might we avoid the risks of technology lock-in? While Medicine Sans Frontieres argued that a cost of goods analysis of the gene expert system would place the all-inclusive cartridge price closer to $5, should public funders and pooled procurement agencies insist on greater transparency of what goes into the price point? In this way, we can better assess fair return on public financing. How can we use the mix of push and pull financing 
to achieve our access goals with greater coordination and clarity. After all, we would expect no less of the diagnostic developer to do the same for its shareholders. Where is the responsibility and accountability of public stewardship vested? We are also excited to see innovation motivated by equity considerations. Two such developments of note come from MSF. Well, on the left, Antibiago is an AI-based mobile app designed to help interpret antibiotic susceptibility testing, particularly where trained technicians for local microbiology labs may not be available. It has been undergoing clinical evaluation and the process of CE mark designation. And on the right, MSF has put forward the concept of the mini lab, the idea of deploying a core laboratory system for rapid setup and field settings from conflict ridden areas to refugee camps where such facilities might not be otherwise readily available. Both of these approach the idea of equity in ways that we might take up for AMR diagnostics, innovation with equity in mind. Just to sum up with a few closing thoughts, taking a systems perspective, we might consider more strategically how we might nurture dual markets if they might ensure more equitable and sustainable access to diagnostics. These dual markets are not only between high income countries and resource limited markets, but also diagnostic platforms that might serve clinical medicine and wastewater surveillance, monitoring foodborne pathogens and AMR hotspots in the environment and so on. Considering how to bundle the development, use or reimbursement of diagnostics with drugs also is worth deeper reflection. How might we support a companion diagnostic for multiple drug developers working on treatments for high priority bacterial pathogens? And how could that diagnostic help lower the cost of clinical trial recruitment? How might we bundle use or reimbursement of diagnostics for drugs? This may be most obvious for second line parenteral antibiotics for multi-drug resistant infections, but is there social innovation to be done to change the calculus where the cost of a dengue diagnostic might otherwise be more expensive than empiric treatment with antibiotics? And finally, how might we give diagnostics as well as vaccines their proper role as complementary technologies to antibiotics? No one blinks when billions are called for in public financing for new drugs, but should we not consider the opportunity cost that such funding might be effectively deployed for developing and fielding complementary technologies like diagnostics? Diagnostics are a key component of a package of AMR containment measures that the OECD proposed a few years back. AMR-related complications across 33 OECD and EU countries could cost up to $3.5 billion each year between 2015 and 2050, much of it from longer hospital stays. And in OECD countries, a comprehensive intervention package that addresses AMR both in hospitals and clinics through improved hygiene and stewardship, and also in communities through delayed prescriptions, mass media campaigns, and rapid diagnostic tests could come to just $2 per capita a year. Such an investment would avert 47,000 deaths a year in OECD countries, and the public health package could pay for itself in under a year and save $4.8 billion a year in OECD countries. We should make diagnostics part of such a package and make this a best buy bargain for the global development community. I hope this provides a useful starter list for re-engineering how we might bring AMR diagnostics to market with equitable access. Thank you for the opportunity for sharing these reflections. Well, thank you to all our panelists. And before we move into our discussion, um, I want to remind folks that all of the panelists' recordings and slides will be made publicly available on the NASM webpage. Um, before we open it up to uh, audience Q&A and discussion, I wanted to ask a, a couple of questions of our panelists. I think you all did a, a really outstanding job outlining the equity considerations that are at play as we think about um, development and clinical integration of new diagnostics to address AMR. Um, and I think you made what I thought was a very compelling case for putting equity front and center as we're thinking about these issues. So what I get really excited to do is to dive into the solutions. Um, and I was really struck um, by both Dr. Evans and Dr. Pettigrew talking about how equity has not really been at the forefront of our conversations about AMR. The, the data around disproportionate impacts um, of resistant infections are, are still pretty sparse. Um, I believe this year was actually the first year that CDC um, publicly released and, and spotlighted um, some data 
on the disproportionate impacts of AMR, though, as, as Dr. Pettigrew said, the data were more examples rather than a real comprehensive picture. Um, and so I wanted to get the panel's thoughts on how much of a, a game changer could it be if we actually did have a real comprehensive picture of the disproportionate of a, uh, impact of AMR? And what are some of the barriers to getting that data and, and how can we overcome those barriers? Who would like to start? We'll take a volunteer. I can uh, dive on this first. Um, I mean, so one of the, so let's identify two issues. One is the capacity to collect data in kind of rapid times, uh, in kind of high levels of granularity, and then share it between researchers, administrators, whomever wants to know this kind of information. Um, so we saw this uh, during COVID, um, the, the fragmentation of health systems either within the United States or across the globe means that collecting this kind of data can be very, very burdensome. Um, then there's an issue of data management, um, which is that um, even if you were to do this kind of surveillance, uh, kind of competing and uh, incompatible platforms of storing this data can then make it very difficult to actually produce it. But as Dr. So also pointed out, there's also a diagnostic capacity issue, which is that there are lots of labs that simply don't have the tools to do this. Um, so you would need to get the tools to be able to collect the data, to then share the data, to then publish it in a way that we can read either with machines or ourselves. And maybe I, I can add a little bit. I think we need to do a lot of work collecting the data, but we also really need to think about what data we are collecting. And many of our, of our definitions and our labels are overly broad and they're not necessarily useful, right? So I mentioned the challenges of race and ethnicity. And are we talking about biological aspects? Are we talking about um, sociocultural determinants? And so the data need to really be tailored to the type of information that we think we need that will get us at the underlying mechanism. So collecting the data with the traditional standard definitions that we use now are a good start because they will help us identify who's at most risk and where resources are most needed. But it doesn't really get at the underlying mechanisms involved. And so, for example, if you think about Asians in the United States, that could be individuals from India, that could be people from China. You know, it's such a broad definition as to be somewhat useless in many cases. And so what are the other data points that we wanna collect? So factors like insurance status, socioeconomic status, and these are very challenging data points to collect, especially in the healthcare system. And then there's privacy issues. And in terms of participation in studies, I think we really need to think about trust and addressing barriers to access. So who participates in the study? Who's willing to give their data? Are people willing to share genetic information? those types of issues also need to be addressed. But if we get, you know, we have to start somewhere and right now we don't have even the sort of macro data on race, ethnicity, and we do know that there are many groups that are underrepresented and are, we're, we're just not seeing them. So we don't have a handle on, on what their experiences and what the infections are and what the drivers are of these infections. If I might add a global um, health lens uh, to, I think, what um, both uh, Dan, uh, what Nicholas and actually um, Melinda actually um, put forward. You know, the, we've had growing, actually, of course, recognition of the, of the magnitude, of course, of the AMR problem. Certainly, the Lancet Graham study putting the number at 1.27 million uh, people in 2019 dying of drug resistant bacterial infections. And the World Bank before that actually telling us that, in fact, if AMR went unchecked, that up to 24 million more people could be forced into extreme poverty by 2030. It just seems that, unfortunately, these numbers are not enough and for, uh, for us to translate this into to policymakers to provide the necessary and commensurate resources. So we do need to, I think, as Melinda in particular was highlighting, we need to understand the mechanisms behind it. But the challenges of addressing inequity, of equity actually often is not being able to put a face to inequity. And that's why the stories of, of people like Mallory Smith are so important. And AMR really spans many more um, diseases than actually a typical, for example, mobilization effort or in a disease specific area um, actually is, is handled. So mobilizing as a cystic fibrosis community has, is very different than being able to mobilize across AMR. And that's been a challenge we've certainly faced in REACT actually on antibiotic resistance over the years. You know, as we've tried to actually lift this issue up to the global stage. Um, and we do need to figure out a way in which to 
translate the data with a simplicity beyond the complexity, but still recognizing the mechanisms behind them for framing the issue so policymakers will invest today on a problem that oftentimes they cannot actually see um, in the same fashion as they might actually a more specific disease, would so be it diabetes or be it actually cancer, you know, and this is the challenge AMR's community, I think, has faced that's somewhat different than others. Perhaps we should be able to take some lessons from other community, patient communities as well to do a better job, but it has been a struggle. And I hope that we can figure out a way both to collect the data, which is so critically important, and to translate that in a way that you lead to actionable actual results. Yeah, I, I guess now it's really kind of complementing what Anthony said. So I, I think we do need better data, but I think we would be naive if we thought just data alone and the evidence we, we, would be enough to spur action. And, and so uh, we have to be realistic that, um, first of all, equity arguments are, there are a lot of e different equity arguments out there for a lot of different pathogens and, and conditions. They're not false, they're, they're real, but um, nevertheless, um, resources are limited and the global economic situation is such that resources will be limited. So equity arguments alone, um, we, we won't do the right thing just because it's the right thing. I think we've seen that and you know you can look at COVAX as the, the example and I, I'd like to be more, um, optimistic about humans, but I, but I feel like we need to build equitable systems, not necessarily expect that equity will come out of, out of uh, just goodwill. And so what does that mean? I think that means um, we, we recognize, Anthony mentioned, you know, the political cycles are, are relatively short, and so this really needs to be translated to a couple different things. A human face to it, and so people get it, and that builds constituents. And then um, re real world uh, political um, and economic arguments that, uh, that a politician can get behind because they have a constituent who demands it, and they have something on a cycle that they understand that it's the, to, to their benefit that they say, okay, I can save money, I can get the votes, I can stay in office. Uh, I think that's the unfortunate reality of, of how the, the systems work. And so we need the data, but we also need to figure out how to, how to use those data in in the, in the most effective way. I have one um, scientific, non-medical perspective. Um, That's kind. Well, what I uh, learned in this journey is that uh, microphone here, like that. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so I learned that Kevin McCarthy is behind much of this work because of valley fever affecting the constituents in his district, and. That's just one example. I've heard many different ones. When I mentioned the amputee in my 250 talks, this was the first time I've actually mentioned them because that just happened. But that was a real aha moment for me because what I realized was I've always been advocating for the CF community and they have their issues, but the sum is greater than the whole of its parts. So if you take Rob Perdue, who's in Kevin McCarthy's district, who's dealing with valley fever and you put a face to it and you take Kathy Granger and she's in the amputee community and you put her face to that community and you take Mallory for the CF, that's one way because I do think you have to build these um, public faces so that people can actually have a face to identify. But the real big problem that I opened this talk with and now op I open every talk with is that I'm out in the public all the time and people don't know what AMR is. I'm very active in my community in Los Angeles and most of the doctors at Cedar sinai and UCLA when I say oh, I'm going, I'm going to be talking about AMR. They're like, what's that? As soon as I say resistant bacteria, oh, got it, no problem. They all get it, but they don't even know that the acronym, if they're not working in that space. And one of the things I've been doing is putting together sort of a list of the problems, and one of them is what I call the alphabet soup of this area. There's DR, there's DRI, there's squash superbugs, there's AMR. It just seems to be a lack of consistency in the messaging, and I'm a publicist by training, so this really just speaks to me as the problem. So identifying the problem, putting a label to it, putting faces to it, it's sort of, that has to happen outside of the inner, I call them echo chambers, because I've gone to a lot of these meetings now, and you guys are disseminating this amazing information that people don't really know about. So it's that two approach of where you're doing the work, but you're also amplifying it outside so people understand there's a problem because they won't know to ask their doctors for access and you can't really address equity until you even understand that you don't even know what it is you're not getting. So that's my two cents. 
I wanted to follow up on one other topic that came up in um, a couple of the presentations before we open things up to audience questions. So um, Dr. Pettigrew, I know, spoke about the need for more diverse enrollment in our AMR studies and clinical trials and talked about some of the different ways we can get there. So I'd love to hear some perspectives from others on the panel about how to diversify our enrollment in these kinds of studies. Potentially, are there lessons we could learn from um, COVID-19 studies? And then I'd also like to hear thoughts on what safeguards are necessary to make sure we're protecting vulnerable populations, historically marginalized groups, from any potential harms of participating in research. Any volunteers to go first? <laughs> Dr. So? I could kick off perhaps the discussions a little. Um, Certainly, you know, this is a critical area. Um, and we, when we think about diverse enrollment, we also think globally um, that, in fact, in different settings, it could play out very differently as to how uh, various uh, technologies, in fact, are effectively applied. Um, so one approach would be, of course, to make it easier for um, diagnostics to be able to be tested um, in the clinical trial, actually, um, setting. And so, and I think the antibiotic resistance leadership group has done some work, of course, I'm sure along these lines in the States. Um, but as we know, certainly from our experience with COVID-19 abroad, that oftentimes the trials go to where the infrastructure is rather than where the infrastructure could be or needs to be. And part of that, of course, is figuring out how do you build a clinical trial platform that's ready to go. And part of that also is bringing, making sure that there is, a, say, a companion diagnostic for a range, say, of gram-negative pathogens that we could, in fact, provide a group of actually drug developers so they can use the diagnostic to both accelerate and hopefully lower the cost of clinical trial recruitment by enable both to co-locate, of course, so the clinical trial platforms in places where, in fact, we need to actually seek diverse populations um, for these studies and also providing the tools by which actually they can do so more effectively. We can better align these things, but we do need actually more attention to the innovation ecosystem building the clinical trial infrastructure so it's ready to be there where in fact diverse populations are. Otherwise, we'll just continue to go like look at the light under the lamppost and that is regret that would be regrettable. I'll add um, a, a very high level, unrealistic, um, but nevertheless, I hope valuable thing to say. You know, if you, were, if you were starting all this from the beginning, right, you were just making your own country and your own system, you would never do it the way we do it, right? You would say, okay, let, let's, let's have, you know, some basic science things and we'll, we'll go through that. And then people uh, present those data, and then if someone feels like going on to the next step, and you know maybe someone will do a, a clinical trial, and then if they have a good product, and then maybe there's some a company that would like to take that and do something with it, you, you would you would try to see this all the way through, right? You would say, okay, what we need is a vaccine or a product or a diagnostic or whatever, and so here's what we'll do in the early phases, and then we'll have a system to see this all all the way through. We don't have that at all. Basically, we have a very haphazard, disjointed kind of approach to this, and that has an impact on the clinical trials and has impact on, on, the, uh, on the enrollment in clinical trials and inequity in those trials because people need to see the value of it, right? And so it's very difficult to, for many people to see the value chain along those clinical trials, especially for something like you said, you might point AMR, people don't know what that is. We were able to get people to enroll in a clinical trial for an Ebola vaccine in the Democratic Republic of the Congo because there was an Ebola outbreak going on, so people saw the value of it. There was still a lot of skepticism things and the right messaging that I, I hope we did, and, and we had a lot of people who did enroll. But, but I think that um, that's a much different situation because people don't recognize the value, the value chain of AMR. They, I, don't, I think, you know, what you mentioned, I doubt if most people read a, an, an article in the newspaper, one's about AMR and the other one's about super bugs, I doubt they actually even equate those and know what those, those two things mean. So, so I think that's you know, one of the things that we need to do, and, and it, it is a, a big picture thing that for this and many other things that we need to, to strive for in making sure that there's something that's all along the value chain. And sorry to keep coming back to Ebola, but that's a little bit you know where a lot of my experience is. But we have a situation now where we went through processes, very intensive processes in sub-Saharan Africa over the last few years to get vaccines and therapeutics that we have some data now that work for, um, that, for that uh, disease, but they're not available to people in the region um, where the disease is endemic. And, and so this is a real problem. And and that's a real problem, again, to coming back to this point, you know, how do you get people to be engaged in trials and how you do, do you get equity when people say, what am I really getting out of this? It shouldn't all just be because people are doing it out of the, their goodness of their heart. 
So I think that a, a marginalized group that gets talked about rarely, but I think is really important, especially in light of Ms. Shader Smith's comments, is the disability community. Um, so AMR is uh, a, a pathogen that appears to be more likely to kind of be something that's going to be in your life if you are someone who suffers from a disability or a chronic illness. So if you are an amputee, if you have CF, if you have any kind of port, um, if you are bedridden, there are a number of other comorbidities that are going to come along with the possibility of AMR. And in fact, you know, I came to AMR initially through a before it was called AMR, getting to this naming problem, um, through Marin McKenna's lovely book, Superbug, right, in which she starts to kind of deal with MRSA. Um, and I think that one of the things for research purposes is that disability communities are very empowered internally to want to engage in the research process. And that's because they are typically people who, on, for whom medicine is is a lifeline um it is something that they that they need in their lives as part of kind of living their lives to the fullest extent that they can um in terms of potential for exploitation as well they are often groups that are empowered to kind of be counter exploitative within themselves in part because they have dealt again with the medical establishment for as long as they have um and so i think that when we're talking about collecting data one of the things that i think is really important is that you know i'm reminded of um you know, you read an article in the New England Journal and it will be like number of comorbidities will be in table two or something like that. But there really is a need to do much kind of more deeper level explorations of the way that AMR interacts with different kinds of chronic conditions and comorbidities and disabilities. So we'll move now to audience questions and audience discussion, um, both for our folks watching digitally or virtually, um, as well as for our people here in the room. Um, I think it looks like there are some things already in the chat. So um, Andrew, I'll check in with you for any virtual questions. Yeah, so we have one question that came in. Um, how can considerations for diversity and equity be more intentionally incorporated from the start of the development process for antibiotic resistance diagnostics? I mean, I, I can start off on that. I mean, I think the first thing we have to do is ask the question, and we're doing that right here. And we also need to think about the field itself, how diverse the field is. As Anthony mentioned, we need to think about where the trials are considered. But we all approach the world and research problems and challenges with our own lens based on our own experiences. And if we don't have diverse investigators running the trials who have lived experience and who know what the challenges are, um, we won't get diverse participation. Um, we have to think about access. I mentioned where the sites are, but are people able to access these sites? Do they need reimbursement for travel? Do they have to take time off of work? All of those types of things will help address participation from the beginning. And then we need to think about the value added, as was mentioned. And so people really need to feel like this is a problem that, that will impact them and that the solutions will be something they'll benefit from at the end of the day. So we don't want to have trials where, you know, the, the drugs are being tested in community A and they know that the devices will be actually used in another community. And so I think communication, messaging, having this equity lens from the start and thinking about this from a systems level. So where, where, where do these challenges arise within the system and then tackling them? And, and the solutions will be very different by the different disease that we're talking about. Um, but just having the conversation and having equity front and center from the start and asking the right questions um, will, will launch us to be able to solve the problem. Yeah, I think that's the major point, is really asking the questions from the start, so I totally agree with that comment. I also do think we need, we need to think about, you know, what sorts of contracts need to be worked out with um, with people engaged in, in clinical trials and other studies that that um, don't leave this just completely to chance, that, to goodwill, that, okay, great, you know, this will this will help humankind down the, down the road, and you're part of humankind, so there'll be something for you. I think we need to be a little bit more realistic about that. And realistic, so that doesn't mean all of these things um, usually do take time. We've learned that they can be faster than we used to think, but nevertheless, they take time. So we can't promise that, okay, if you engage in a trial next year, there'll be a treatment for everybody who has that particular syndrome um, or disease. 
fees, but nevertheless, I think we do need to have a little bit more of an honest contract and engagement with participants and communities uh, when we approach this. I also want to pick, pick up on actually what uh, Dan had mentioned earlier, um, which was um, the, the importance actually that the diagnostic technology must come at an affordable price point. And um, absent that, it's going to be very challenging to get to gain the kind of enrollment of diverse populations that they're never going to benefit <laughs> from actually what uh, might c come forward. And that means building into the research system, I think, much as uh, Nicholas was pointing out earlier in, this, in the story of the Indonesian um, concerns over avian flu wild virus sample um, provi provi provision, um, that they have to be able to see the potential benefits for their communities. And that means we could, and one place where we can do this type of intervention would be in target product profiles. We could specify a little more clearly what in fact actually an optimal diagnostic um, should be in terms of both price point and in terms of actually how we might be able to reach particular resource limit settings. Um, if we did that, that would help change, of course, how some of these, um, we wouldn't be spending so much time adapting diagnostics. We spend more time actually making sure they're targeted from the start actually for those resource limit settings. And then of course we need to invest in the research to look at the sociology behind the use of these diagnostics so that in fact when they reach these communities they are used as intended and they have the right actually impact because otherwise you may have clinicians saying that really is not going to sway me <laughs> it doesn't change my pre-test to post-test probability enough to make a difference in how i'm going to have to respond to the patient in front of me and so these are some of the things i hope we might be able to build into the process I think there's a number of creative ways you can also engage in the design process from an equity and inclusivity lens. Um, uh, and just kind of to briefly touch on the Indonesian issue, I think this is kind of one of those rare moments of international activism where a, developed, a, a developing nation was willing to put the entire influenza pandemic preparedness operation on hold um, for its own self-interest. And there were lots of cries that it was an irresponsible thing to do. And Indonesia's basic reply can be summed up as, well, if the status quo continues, we're dead anyway, so we may as well do it like this. Um, it's a hard ball to play, but I don't think in retrospect it was a terrible way to play it. I want to talk about a different kind of inclusivity issue um, and go to the, the COVID home tests. Um, now, this is a, a personal story, but it seems like personal stories, as was kind of previously uh, stated, uh, can be powerful. Um, my wife is an amputee, and when she needs to use a COVID at home test, she can do a nasal swab just fine, but everything else in those packages requires the hands of a surgeon to be able to actually like administer, right? Whether it's those tiny little caps on the squeezy liquid bottles, or like adding the liquids to this and that and stirring this thing and the other, or even just getting the drops in the relevant wells for whichever test is your favorite test. And I'm sure at this point we've all got you know our own little teams that we're part of for our um, at-home tests. Um, this is a, a series of design choices, which I'm sure were made by people who were not amputees, because amputees are typically not engaged in design processes for at-home point-of-care diagnostics. But it might be useful if we're really serious about everyone being able to COVID test at, at will whenever they need to, which at this point I think is the only strategy left in the United States government. Um, that someone had thought of that ahead of time. So when we think about equity and inclusivity, we can go all the way back to fundamental design principles in addition to the actual kind of price points, uh, funding mechanisms, and so on. So we now welcome um, other audience members in the room with any questions. And um, before we start calling on people, just a couple of reminders. Please push speak and speak into your microphone and state your um, name and affiliation. Start here, and we'll work our way across. Uh, Kent Kester from IAVI. A really uh, powerful session. I want to come back to something that, that Diane said that, that really, I think, to me, crystallized the issue. I mean, if we think of diseases that have advocacy, that, that sort of um, mobilize politicians, policymakers, the public, we think of sort of single-issue things like whether it's CF, polio in the 1940s and 1950s. Think of all the magazine articles showing people on iron lungs, swine flu, Ebola, scary stuff, and it gets a lot of play. And, and we know that AMR, it's not, it's not one disease. It, it's, a, it's, 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 a, it's a concept. And so, and it really, I think, represents a, kind of a hidden epidemic or pandemic, as, as Dan said, because it comes in all different flavors. I mean, some people, you know, their, their brush with AMR is, 
is the UTI that they had to have four rounds of antibiotics before they finally cleared it. You know, and other people, of course, with much more serious or, or worse conditions. So I guess the question is, is, is how best, because the science is there, as we heard yesterday, there's no shortage of, of good science. It's progressing. Yes, it's costly. And there are a variety of policy and reimbursement and other factors that have to be worked through. But we've seen when the public is engaged, when the public is mobilized, that, that, can, have, that can play a major role. And so I'm, I'm just curious if people have thoughts on, on, on how, how this can be done. Because, Diane, you're, you're exactly right. AMR, superbugs, all this other kind of stuff. And it becomes just kind of just, just talk. And, and I don't think people make the connections. So I'm, I'm just curious to see if people have any thoughts in that regard. Thanks. Uh, the, the only thought I, that I have, honestly, and just I guess because it came up, is that um, if we want to have public engagement and constituencies, I think AMR is not the term. <laughs> I think people just will not get that. You know, we should probably not to to engage in hyperbole, but you know, probably just agree that we're going to call the superbugs that people can say, okay, I get that. That's the thing that's that's hard to treat. And can um, I just respond to that? Yeah, please. <laughs> okay, sorry. Not to be confrontational, but I actually think AMR is a really good term. I think the problem is that it's not used consistently and it hasn't been publicized. It's like monkeypox, apple. There are words and terms that once you, you know what they are and you've been hit with them. The problem for me, the, my reaction, is that it hasn't been consistently used. So yes, superbugs is good, but the problem is the thing about AMR, it allows you to talk about resistance as a thing and resistant bacteria. So, but if everybody in the whole world, let's just look at the World Health Organization tri trickle down. If everybody started with AMR, if every group came together and put one person as a spokesperson for their group, and there was this top-down approach where every, in every direction, AMR was blasted the way monkeypox was. All of a sudden, monkeypox, everybody knew about monkeypox out of nowhere because it was this consistent, concerted effort that I actually think came from the White House, because when I was at OSTP, they were starting to engage with me, you were there, hello, on AMR, and then actually Dr. Matthew Hepburn said, we have to put a pause on it because monkeypox. So all of a sudden, and all communications were around that, there was press everywhere. I think if the AMR community were to mobilize and to say, we're going to make this the priority, which is just getting, just ed basic education on what it is. And it went out everywhere, not just in Stat News or Medscape or these publications that you guys distribute internally, but the Today Show put out, you know, they put an amputee, they put a CF patient, they put a caregiver, somebody who is dead, somebody who, had, you know, who is alive. And you started creating this sort of, for lack of a better word, a marketing plan to market AMR, to sell AMR as a concept, I think it would be the perfect way. I think the problem is, and you can switch it to superbugs, and, and I also think this is in my head because when I asked somebody about changing the name, they said people are, it's way too far down the line. And of all the terms that I've heard, the most common one is AMR, right? So everybody within this universe is using that term. So the question is you just have to take it outside of your world and introduce it in a very, very, very concerted way. Now, one of the things I've been doing with Salt in My Soul is using it in every audience, whether it's the book, my talk, or the film. And everybody that I come in contact now knows. Now the UK is bringing the mold to change the world to DC next week and then to Atlanta. That's another way to reach people. I think that storytelling, however you do it, it can be in talks, it can be in films, it can be in TV. Bring people from Hollywood to the table who are writing their scripts for the current show that they're watching. If somebody on a television show is talking about AMR, and at the same time, it's on the Today Show, and then the next week you see it in USA Today, and then somebody on the radio. But it, it really has to have this global marketing plan, and it has to bring people from the outside in. I'm the only outsider in the room, I think, today, right? Everybody else is, is already here. You guys are doing this great information. And every once in a while, I hear about something, and I'm constantly hearing that, well, I, there was this meeting, but there's also that meeting, and so everybody's just doing their little part within their world, and I think that it's just about taking the messaging out. So I'm sorry to interrupt you, but that was my long. <laughs> no problem. I'm happy to be interrupted and, and happy to, to, uh, to um, be corrected. 
and you've thought through this much more than I have in terms of the terminology and uh, and um, you know so but uh, so I you know I'm I'm agnostic in terms of what we call it but I do agree that we probably need to agree on what we're going to call it and, and then try to have um, a, a consistent message about what that means and then how, the and then and then how do we get that message out I I do fear however that we're we're late, of course, you know, because it, it's easier for the news cycles when you have something that's new on the scene, right? When you have monkeypox, okay, that's a new thing that we weren't seeing. That's pretty easy to get out there and people to, to pay attention to. Something that you say, you know, and it's almost counterintuitive, but you say, this is a pandemic that's been going on for a while now. They say, well, if it's been going on for a while, it can't be that big a deal because it's, it's not really new and it's not the thing that, that someone from the Washington Post actually wants to write about that often. But I, I don't, you know, I, I don't disagree that we need to try to galvanize that message more uniformly, but it's, it's not an easy task, as you well know. So there are, it seems like there's two issues that we could pass out really quickly here. One is what we call this, um, and then the other is how we message it. Um, I want to kind of put a provocation out there because I've got to be honest, AMR sounds like an NPR affiliate to me, like, like, and so I'm kind of like... Um, but the other thing is, is that one of the, you know, so I just finished uh, writing a book that's coming out in May on why we declare war, war on some diseases but not others. Um, and one of the things that first struck me about your question is if I was going to declare war on X, right, what would I do in the context of AMR? Um, and one of the things that we often see with these kind of provocating moves, and I'm not saying you should always declare war on diseases because Americans love declaring war on stuff and then not following through. Um, but you could think about the war on cancer or the cancer moonshot, right? I don't think like the war on non-Hodgkin's lymphoma would be quite as sexy a messaging kind of brand as on cancer, right? Even though cancer is a bunch of things. Um, and so one of the things to maybe kind of want to broaden your scope is something like, um, we are just dealing with AMR in the context of global climate change. We're dealing with antifungal resistant um, kind of emergence. We're dealing with the emergence of artemisinin resistance in antimalarials. Um, there are a number of things that are happening all at once, and it may be there may be kind of prudential reasons to want to expand your scope in terms of the messaging. And then I absolutely agree that if you're going to hit people with messaging on this, it has to be one often, but two have really tractable paradigm cases, right? And I think that in AMR there are paradigm cases. Um, one of them has been created here, but then there are others. Um, you know, the, the post antibiotic era is the post transplant era, right? Is one of these kind of really strong messaging themes that I think people can get behind um, or understand is that, you know, your grandmother won't be able to have a hip replacement without antibiotics. Um, this is another set of stories that people can tell, and this partly dives into this problem is that AMR is something that often happens to people who are already sick. And when we think about messaging, we're often really good at neglecting people who are already sick, um, where uh, other diseases strike people in their prime. AMR can strike you in your prime, but it can often strike you in your prime through something else. And it's the AMR that kills you, but it's the, it's the disease that caused it. I will just say, when I tell members of Congress you won't be able to get your hip replacement if we don't have antibiotics, you won't be able to get your cancer chemotherapy if we don't have antibiotics, those members of Congress then co-sponsor the Pasteur Act, so I, I think we're on to something. <laughs> um, I know we had a number of other hands up in the audience. Um, yes, in the back. Hi, I'm Ann Taylor, the uh, co-chair of the National Academies Forum on Drug Devel Discovery, Development, and Translation. So um, I had two points. One is, even though I'm a physician, an academic physician, um, yesterday I was really frustrated by the number of acronyms you guys were using that I didn't understand. So um, this is just a reminder, when you get out there, you need to do a better job. Of, and it's not that hard to say antibiotic resistance instead of um, AMR. So it's just a reminder, and our language is important. Um, but more importantly, um, one of the things that we're working on um, is exactly this topic of a community network of um, clinical trial sites. Um, pharma is also working on that and has, has a big initiative that they've um, struck up with a, a couple of um, major medical institutions. And so we would love to have somebody from the antibiotic resistance under the device space um, work with us on preparing that workshop um, because I think there are different needs for antibiotics than there are for cancer and um, our concept of what a community network is going to look like is um, still evolving. So. I would welcome um, uh, participation. Thanks. <laughs>
Well, I know we'll have a coffee break after this session, so perhaps some people who are interested can come approach you. Um, Andrew, do we have any other virtual questions? Yes. Uh, so someone asked, what are some priority opportunities to reform funding structures to ensure that diagnostics are accessible to underserved communities in the U.S., as well as to low and middle income countries? Would either of our virtual panelists like to speak up on this one? I tried to address some of this, um, I think, um, in my final slides. So maybe I can give it a start. Um, the, I mean, I think one, we have to take more of a systems perspective because I think diagnostics alone um, may not always be the best way of, of actually advancing um, the opportunity of achieving in, uh, and realizing the social value of diagnostics. So that's one of the reasons why I suggested dual markets is one way of thinking about this in a way that oftentimes may recruit additional allies, additional reasons, actually other sectors that might be interested. We have a great need, for example, for diagnostics um, for uh, what I hope will be eventually a global wastewater surveillance network that will monitor and track potential emerging infection that may surface around the world. I think COVID-19 has taught us the value, certainly, of this um, today. But for years, actually, the polio a virus laboratory network, in fact, could, could uh, and the investment in that, which is being transitioned, could in fact be built upon before it actually disappears. We have a tremendous opportunity to look at dual purposes of diagno diagnostics to at least enable a stronger actually coalition, as I think um, was called for um, um, by Dan, to actually uh, pursue um, this, um, diagnostic development. Bundling the, the development use and reimbursement diagnostics with drugs also maybe another way. And I think, again, at each point in the value chain, we might think about how that might be done strategically in a way that enables, again, diagnostics to come forward. Um, and a service package um, that, in fact, um, I think part of the problem is we just really are not selling on diagnostics really as part of the package of how we address AMR effectively. And we need to do make it part of that package, but it's always harder to sell than, say, a vaccine, right? It is not a, a, a magic bullet um, approach. It is a, oftentimes it has other sort of uh, um, a, a reach that, are, that may be preventative targeting and so on. And so we, we might, might we'll try to make it a best part of a best buy bargain as well to tackle AMR. See, uh, <laughs> one Susan. of you in the back, <laughs> Susan. Um, it's Jean Patel from Beckman Culture Microbiology, and it's a very similar question, but it's what are the strategies that would drive a government to take up testing where it doesn't exist? I think one of the ideas that I just heard was surveillance data, demonstrating that antimicrobial resistance does exist in the community. Other ideas I've heard is really measuring um, the rate of deaths or mortality from antimicrobial resistance. What, what are examples of winning strategies? Um, I, I guess I'll, I'll come back to the similar point that I made earlier, but I, I think that you need to make very, for, for policymakers and politicians, you have to have very clear, often economic arguments, I think. So saving lives doesn't do it. Um, it really has to be something where you say, this, this is the money that you're going to save. The problem with that is that the political cycles, of course, are relatively short. And so saying saving money over the next 20 years, people think, well, I'm not going to be in office you know, in 20 years. And so I, I need to have a, a, a result that is more short term and that I can show something more short term. But um, and, and again, I don't want to sound overly skeptical, but I, I do think we need to boil us down often to, to clear economic arguments that people will get behind, and, and that's somewhere um, I've seen the most traction. And, and, then, and then, as Anthony said, um, bundling things beyond diagnostics. We're here to talk about diagnostics. We all believe in that, but I think that if we just use that as a singular issue, I think that's probably um, not as convincing uh, necessarily. So if we could say, okay, here's, the, here's how we can package different things along the value chain and diagnostics that are necessary and the other elements of antibiotic development and kind of putting that together so people get an idea of the, the bigger picture that might be a more of an attractive package than just one thing independently. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And I think I, I am hopeful that we are on the precipice of getting some very large, significant new investments in antibiotic development. And I think we need to connect the dots for policymakers that 
diagnostics help preserve the efficacy and the lifespan of those antibiotics. They help preserve that federal investment in these antibiotics, antibiotics that we are you know, prepared to spend billions of dollars on. Um, so I think connecting those dots for policymakers is really important. And Susan, did you have a question? Please. So in LA, where I live, which there's a lot of money, there's real estate money, there's Hollywood money, there's a lot of money. And everybody that I know with money brags about their doctor, who when they get sick, they don't have to go in. Their doctor just writes them a prescription. This came up when I was on Capitol Hill with Michael Bennett and Kevin McCarthy. And I don't remember who the doctor, excuse me, I don't remember who the doctor was on the panel, but there was a big debate about in a you know, short, quick debate about whether or not it was the pediatricians or the internists, and they were talking about who was doing this. But that is definitely an issue. You talk about equity and access, and one of the things that comes with access is that, and I hear it all the time. So I don't know how you address that, but. We got a question in front. Hi, Kerry Johns with Amplify DX. Uh, it's kind of building on what Dr. Patel just commented on surveillance, but is uh, AMR or antibiotic resistance routinely collected uh, as a surveillance within, say, patient medical records? So I know there is, um, in the United States at least, the National Healthcare Safety Network, which can pull data from um, records, but not every hospital is right now connected to that network and able to report those data. Um, Dr. Patel? And the WHO um, AMR surveillance program also pulls data from hospitals um, wherever it exists. And so that's one of the challenges is sometimes it doesn't exist. Yeah, I was going to just add that wherever it exists in many LMICs is that it doesn't exist. I mean, if you just look at the capacity for blood cultures, for example, and very, very infrequently found in most secondary and even tertiary care hospitals in a lot of LMICs. So there's um, not a lot of data unless you really go after it. You know, you make a specific concerted effort to, to collect it and put in the capacity and the infrastructure to do so. That's, that's a generalization, but I think it's true for many countries, and it depends upon what, what level you're, you're talking about. There's you know, some excellent centers in, in South Africa collecting lots of data, but if you look at your routine um, secondary, even tertiary hospital in the Congo, for example, you're not going to get not only not AMR data, you're not really going to get uh, a, a pathogen-specific um, diagnostic for, uh, for most bacteria. And I think, did we have another question over here? Were you... Were you waiting? <laughs> uh, sure, thanks. Paul Etter, uh, NIH uh, Diagnostics. So uh, first, a couple comments. Uh, AMR can re uh, refer to antiparasitics, I think, and antiprotozoals. So it can be broad enough. I think AMR is a good term. Secondly, um, in, in the US government, in the NIH, at uh, National Institute of Biomedical Imaging and Bioengineering, NIBIB, so that'll help the person who needs that. Uh, they have a program specifically for developing new COVID diagnostics for um, disability communities. And so that's helpful, maybe late to the game, but there's a dedication to that for that research. There's also a RADx program for underserved communities, RADx up. So uh, tests that can be distributed, uh, deployed in ways that can reach those communities, maybe also late to the game. But the question I wanted to ask many minutes ago was back to uh, equity in clinical trials. And Dr. Pettigrew, you had so much insight into that. Thanks so much. I'd like to approach the solution from, from the other end, from yours. Your, your solutions are excellent for how we can have uh, greater diversity in trials. But as a scientist and also as a government employee, um, I've funded contracts where, according to U.S. Department of Health and Human Services rules, the clinical studies for these diagnostics were required to have a, a complete diversity of the American population. And it wasn't for a, uh, to be um, a politically correct in any way. It was for the science. In order to understand if these host response diagnostic tests are working, you absolutely have to test the complete diversity of the U.S., not just by race, uh, but by geography, even by age. People have an easy understanding that, oh, yeah, we need to test these things in pediatrics. Why can't they also understand we need to test these other diverse uh, 
components of the U.S. population. So by rule, those government contracts were required to have clinical studies include uh, a reflection of the population of the U.S. So that's another way to approach the problem during development, make sure these early validation studies are testing on a broad swath of the American population. Any of our panelists want to comment? Yeah, I, I just wanted to also weigh in on this because this is something that, that my brain gets stuck on. So you mentioned that the science was mentioned and, and the studies really have to represent the people that are impacted by the disease. And we don't always know what pockets are impacted by the disease. And then there's questions about generalizability. But I often think, is it is it the U.S. population that the studies need to represent or is it the, the highest risk groups and how do we achieve enrollment? So for example, if you have um, for Neisseria gonorrhea, if you have rates that are six times higher in one population than another, should the enrollment reflect be six times higher in that population? And so I don't I don't have answers to those questions. And I also just wanted to add there was a there was a comment earlier about surveillance and, and antibiotic resistance and how we're collecting the data. There are many diagnostics that that have been designed for speed and, and thinking about sexually transmitted infections again, like we've gone to a place where we're doing nucleic amplification tests. And so we have a lot of data about who's who's getting sick with these illnesses. And these tests are easy to use, they're fast, they're cost effective, but they don't provide data on antimicrobial resistance. And we're, we're getting to the space where phenotypic resistance testing is expensive. And these differences between genotypic resistance and phenotypic resistance were not there with the science. And so I just also, um, this is a bit off topic, but I was thinking about it from earlier. Uh, we really need to think about who we're collecting the data on, how we're collecting the data, and what data we're collecting, and does it actually provide us with the information that we need? Because there are huge gaps in, in terms of the data based on what types of tests we're actually using to get the numbers. Uh, so this is Paul Etter again, uh, NIH. So uh, to, the, to the first part about uh, what kind of, of tests uh, are looking at population-wide, these were uh, tests to look at the human response to nuclear explosions, so it included everybody in the American population. But for the gonorrhea testing, you're 100% right. That is not thoughtfully considered the percent who are infected and the, and the distribution of the population in the clinical study. That's a really, really, really strong point that's not considered, I can tell you that uh, right now. And the answer for the genomic testing, we actually talked about that yesterday, and that is we are looking at sequencing and ways to predict antibacterial susceptibility testing uh, without actually doing it based on databases of isolates where that has previously been characterized. We're moving towards that, but you're 100% right. We can't just sequence without understanding the real resistance of the organism. Absolutely agree on that. And we've now reached the end of our time, so I want to thank um, all of our panelists and our audience members, um, both here in the room and virtually. Um, invite everyone to enjoy a coffee break, and our next session will be here at 11 a.m. Thank you. Thanks.